Today, I'm very honored and blessed to be with a most amazing man. He's an amazing soul. For many years, he lived a as an uh, undercover cop and also a professional rugby player. And he then went on to become an owner and investor of his own company called Very Fact with over 900 staff. And he's also written a book and called Undercover Prop. And I actually found it in Bondi at the beginning of this year when I was back in Sydney just for a short time. And my heart went out to Dan and I couldn't but smile. It brought back many memories of the time when I was working with the Australian rugby team and was in the World Cup in South Africa in 1995. And unfortunately, the Wallabies didn't win that game. I hope I wasn't the omen because it was the first time the Wallabies had a female with them. And um, I was honored and blessed to go into what they call the courtroom and the jury. And Dan was talking and giving people fines. Oh my God, he is such a comedian. And I think if anything happens with your business, you could become a comedian, no problem. He had the entire room in fits of laughter. And one of the guys said to me, oh, he's always like that, which um, I just seen him as this serious rugby player. So I know today's going to be entertaining. So without further ado, welcome Dan to Wellness Spring. How are you today? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Bev. Yes, that's, uh, you're bringing back some old memories, that's for sure. <laughs> it was certainly a fun time. I'm just intrigued because I didn't realise you were an undercover cop. Somebody told me that you were a policeman, but, and I thought, fair enough, that's fine. But um, be, you, you were playing for the Queensland Reds and actually working in that area. Um, could you please tell the audience how you manage to lead this devil life and not be found out? Well, I usually start uh, explaining it by annoying a lot of people we, uh, by saying that most of the people that I was after were Kiwis and they weren't that bright. So I can, I can say that while I'm in Australia and if I go to New Zealand, I have to go the other way around and say I was after Aussies. But no, it was, it was just uh, by, by pure accident and it shows you how much obviously rugby's changed today. That back then I was very, very fortunate that I played half my, my career as an amateur and then half, half my time as a professional. And that, 95 with that World Cup was the, the, uh, the last game as an amateur and the amateur era, actually. So uh, an interesting time around, around those days. There was a lot of cloak and dagger conversations being ha had about pe uh, to people about this changing the professional, that's for sure. But anyway, I was, I was working um, in, in the Queensland Police. I was there for a dozen years overall. And uh, I went to I was actually trying to become a detective. And, and, um, and at that time, they started, I was still young and needed some more experience and I was I was drafted by um, some of the detectives into the undercover section and so I started doing that work and fortunately um, as I was able to to work around it with my, my rugby and my training and unfortunately so I did that for two and a half years and, and through that two and a half year uh, period that's when my rugby started actually started to take to, you know take off in, with representative honours with representing Queensland and then ultimately with with Australia right at the back end of that time. So, and it was the last nine months or so that uh, took me over into that period of time. And I was sort of uh, in between. I couldn't, I couldn't put the job, I couldn't finish the job and I didn't want to finish rugby. So it was a, it was a big juggling act be between both. And, uh, and I was very fortunate that I had uh, bosses that allowed me to be able to do that as long as I was, uh, making sure I wasn't putting myself for anybody else and, you know, in too much uh, of harm's way. And then there was a couple of people within the rugby circles that, that had to know about what I was actually doing as well. So I had to put my faith in those people, even to the extent of uh, uh, two particular journalists in Brisbane at the time, Wayne Smith, who um, he's just retired as a, as a boss of the Australian, the end of the Australian, um, who, who were kind enough at that time. I had to put my faith in them to say, you know, you can't write anything about about me, you can't put my photos in the paper. 
they were, they were very quick to respond by saying that you know that uh, I didn't do that much and, and uh, they couldn't see my face in my head anyway. It wasn't a good photo. So from that perspective, I was I was very fortunate to have those people around me to be able to juggle that that very interesting period of my life. Wow, I don't know how you manage because. Um... Um, when I was working with the Wallabies, besides being a sports massage therapist and nutritionist, I'm also um, a former psychiatric nurse and registered nurse, and I've gone on to do psych K and loads of brain entrainment courses. And I just wonder in your mind how stressful it could be, because you were like an actor, really, because you were playing two double roles. And, you know, how did you cope with that, with the pressure? from obviously with your family as well, they, they wouldn't be able to really say what you're doing. And did you give yourself any mental prep talks? Oh, no, I think uh, two things. I think rugby actually, from my perspective, I was fortunate that I was able to get away from, from the, the other side and then go to, try, uh, to, to training where possible and play. So I had a bit of an outlet and I had another group of people that I could, I could talk to, not about obviously about work, but just to be, be around and be involved with. So I think that that actually took the, the pressure valve off a little bit for me, whereas unfortunately there was a number of my colleagues um, throughout that period of time who, who did uh, you know, significantly suffer um, uh, from that and, and, and a couple of them actually you know, unfortunately turned to the drugs and, and either died or ended up in jail. You know? And th these are police officers, you know, so it shows you how easy, easily you can stray. But it, it, it's, it becomes all consuming um, in, in what you're doing as, as you have to. And so to have that little bit of an outlet, it was okay for me. But the hardest thing was, and the same with any of the guys, is when you're in those sort of roles, that it's not, it's trying to balance, not get, being, being careful, but not being, not being paranoid. Because if you, if, you, if you get too paranoid, every conversation that's had, you can twist it around to think that someone, you know, has, uh, has, has cottoned on to what you're doing and all that sort of stuff. So it's that little bit of a balance between that. Yeah, you'd have to be exceptional, have an exceptional memory so you don't slip up. And I know in the beginning you started, um, I love the name of Undercover Prop. You started, first of all, in break and entering because you went for a job, I believe, as a detective. And then someone tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, you'd be really good as an undercover cop. And we're looking for someone for break and entering. And from there, which, <laughs> yeah, how did you feel about that? And how did it then lead you to becoming working with the drugs? Well, it's just a, as you very... It, that would tap on the shoulder of the guys. I think they thought I had a, a good head for breaking in this, which means I think that was not very, you're not very pretty. Um, but it was it was something that went by that we, that at the time in Queensland. So it was it was very different than it is now with regards to all the different, you know, the, the ice and the and the pills and all that sort of stuff. It was purely marijuana and heroin, and then heroin was the is it was the big fancy for people to buy. Uh, and they were having a lot of troubles, and the only way that they, that people could get money was it was either you know it was, it was either breaking in and, and stealing, you know, stealing from people, stealing from houses, stealing from people, or, or prostitution. You know, basically was is the only way, and and so they were breaking in us, which would then lead on to the drug issue. So the they were looking at a different way of being able to enter into the drug market through through the uh, the breaking in market. Which, which ultimately worked. Wow. And um, I'm sure everyone asks you, did you do some R&D yourself with the drugs or did you have to take the drugs? Yeah, it's just to a certain extent, extent everybody's got to, to, to dabble in, in certain different areas. You know, it's, it's virtually impossible not to. And because um, I, I read that you had... A, befriended a doctor and you would get an injection mox just to show that you were legit how, how did yeah that's yeah no well, but it was actually my family doctor so uh so i had to go and uh, sit down and have a bit of a conversation with him and he was able to help me out but it's just one of those areas whereby again that um that sort of hard drug 
it's not one of the things, it's not like drinking beer. Not everybody hangs around each other and, and, and does it in front of each other. They just get their gear and, and then they buff. So from that perspective, it's just one of those areas of bricks of credibility to be able to, to have those marks and make sure that people saw the marks. Um, so right. that then, then it takes it takes away then then uh, trying to to suss you out even more. And I read a lot of the druggies. You know, they might not be traffickers, but because they owe a lot of people money, they're always trying to point a finger. And at one stage, someone pointed a finger at you and said, "Oh, he's an undercover cop." But in the book, you said it worked to your advantage. What did it actually feel like when someone's pointing the finger? Well, it, it's uh, again, you're, you're working in a scene or you're in a scene whereby everybody is super paranoid of everybody else. And mm. and, this, and uh, as they say, there's no loyalty amongst thieves. There's definitely no loyalty amongst, uh, amongst druggies, that's for sure. So whatever they, uh, people can do to take the heat off each other, they will. Um, in that situation, he, he just happened to randomly point me out um, and say to try and get the heat off himself. Unfortunately, he was correct. Um, and uh, so I had to sort of look at a way of, of being able to get it. So we just went, I went to the hotel. Most they all confront each other. They all say they're going to kill each other and all that sort of stuff. And so I've gone in to confront him, and we've ended up having a, a decent punch up in, in the uh, in the bar area there. So every, to, you know, I was you know out, outlining that I want that it's pretty bad, it's very bad form um, in that world to be uh, to be. Yeah, pointed out as a, as a copper. So everybody let me alone after that because they, they, they pretty well thought I was. Fantastic. And do you have any exciting stories that you could share with us, obviously without giving names? Like what was the moment in your life got your adrenaline going? Oh, oh look, there was a, there's a few different different areas and, and uh, they, they take a little bit of time to, to go over. I suppose, I suppose one uh, interesting one was whereby uh, we, I was, uh, as I said, working on that job down the coast. Incidentally, it just happened to be the, the gent that I had the punch up with. Um, it, it was afterwards, because he actually came up to me afterwards and, and apologised to me for, for calling me uh, at, you know, calling me out and uh, said it was the wrong thing to do and all that sort of stuff. And we actually got on pretty well after that until they got arrested, of course, and then they fell out of love. But the, the, uh, the fact was that... Um, I was down the coast and, and uh, got a call from from this bloke and he said that he'd asked me, he's got two friends and they were, they'd been doing some, um, breaking in some houses and they had some gear for sale and I actually didn't have any money with me at the time. I wasn't really told, I was trying to get out of work that weekend because I had a big game of foot, football. And so I was going back and forth with him about saying, no, I haven't got anything. And he was really keen to get some money for his mates because they wanted to grab some some heroin and, and, and uh, have a bit of a party. And I finally got it out of him that actually during the week, it was all over the papers in the news. And during the week, they, at that time, the uh, maximum security prison in Brisbane, Robert R. Jail, as it's called, um, had, a, had a breakout. About four guys uh, and drove it through the front gates and uh, took off. I think there was five guys, four got away, three got away, um, one got shot. And, uh, and they took off and it just happened to be that two of his mates were guys from the prison break and, uh, and so I've just gone, oh, they give their guys my weekend, you know, like, uh, and uh, had to go and scramble some money and, and hang around these blokes for, for a couple of days until the, uh, the SWAS guys were able to get in place and then wait till they, they left so I had an excuse to, to say that, that um, someone else had picked them up and, you know, it wasn't someone else had, uh, had fingered them. And, and spotted them and, and the SWAT guys ended up, up grabbing them. So that was a bit of a, 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 a something out of left field that, uh, that and these guys weren't up that happy with their mate afterwards because uh, they got dragged back in. And... Cool. Wow, I can't believe they broke out of the prison, but I know anything is possible. And um, do you miss that life? Would you ever want to go back? Or I know you've got four children. Would you recommend them, for example, to be a policeman? Oh, look, I've got I've got great respect for the for the uh, for the police. And, and my brother has uh, only just retired. He, he had forty years in, in the job. I've got a, a lot of uh, respect for the guys, and and it's it's a very much a, a tough job, uh, even more so these days with regards to the scrutiny 
the public scrutiny that these guys have to get put under, guys and girls, have to get put under um, under tremendous pressure and, and uh, of people because uh, it, it saddens me that there's so many people with such disrespect and lack of respect for for law enforcement and, and emergency responders in general. So that that makes it very tough. So I take my hat off to anybody who, who wants to do it. I, I suppose from my perspective, if the kids if the kids ever wanted to go down that path, um, none of them really have, have said they have. But if if they do, and anybody else, I'd say go for your life. It's a it's a rewarding it's a rewarding job, um, but it's a tough job. And in certain circles, like the stuff that, that I was involved in, I think it's a it, it is a uh, a young man's game. It is a young person's game, you know, it does take its toll. And it does take its toll, like you said, you know, not only are those husbands and kids and stuff like that, and mums and dads who worry about them. So, like I said, I, I have the utmost respect. Fabulous, yeah. Being a nurse, we worked closely with the police, especially in accident and emergency, or, you know, for call outs when I was working for the crisis team. And I know people really don't know what goes on behind the scenes. And I know that when you were working as a country policeman, as a young kid, you were going, you know, you'd be there on the scene, maybe of a shooting and someone's dead. And then you had to go to the morgue as well and then go and tell the family. I think that's a lot of weight to bear on young shoulders in particular, you know, could tarnish you for life or, you know, for any age. So how did you cope with that? Uh, again, I think in one one aspect, it's, it's you're, 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 I don't think about it as much as, as, other, yeah. as, as a, a man who's married and got kids and they've got to go and talk to their, to their um, you know, to their relatives and, and so on. Um, it is, it, it's just something you just got to, you, you never forget. You never forget it, and like this, the, a person who goes to a morgue who smells a morgue. Once they smell it once, they'll never forget it. Um, yeah. And so you, you can't, you can't not remember it. You've just got to try and just, um, you know, put it in, the, in your pocket and, and and move on. You know, and um, unfortunately, yeah, it is it is difficult. And I think from the police perspective, with them being able to starting to extend the age. Of people to enter the end of the service, so they have a little bit more of of uh, life experience before. I think that's that's been a great idea for them instead of taking people like they do with us straight out of school. Right. And would you like to tell the audience a bit about your background, where you grew up, and your family were they in the police, etc. <laughs> yeah, well, no, look, I know. Look, I've gone to a fair few places, but I haven't gone too straight too far from home. If that makes any sense, so. I I, uh, I live and I work probably no more than 15 k's from where I was uh, at the family home, from where I lived all my life. I'm very fortunate. Mum and Dad uh, came over in the 50s from England, so um, they went. Where was back that? For, was, did you say England? Uh, yes, England. Yes. Oh, so, so you got uh, English I, blood. <laughs> yeah, well, I have actually an English passport. I should say for a little while as well. So, but. Um, the, uh, so they came from Liverpool, so they, they you know, obviously grew up through the, uh, the war years and, 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 and obviously a very tough time and, and they came over here for a, for a better life for, for us and I'm very thankful for that because I went back to England for one year and lived in Leeds and when I came back, Dad said, now, now you know why I left, you know, so <laughs> I, I do take my hat, off, my hat off to the English, especially the sports people for training in that, that sort of weather, it just blows my mind. But... The um, yeah, so I, I went to St. Lawrence, so St. Elizabeth's College, the little convent, little convent for the first three years, and then went to St. Lawrence's College, which is a uh, old boys school in South Brisbane from grade four to grade twelve. Finished there and straight into the coppers, and and from there to 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 uh, progress from that that stage. So pretty, uh, I was very very fortunate. Mum mum uh, worked as an accounts lady with a real estate agency and. Um, amongst other things, and, and Dad was a, uh, a local truck driver. And I can, you know, they, they instilled in, in all of us. I've got uh, two brothers, one's uh, recently passed, but uh, oh. they, they instilled in us, they instilled in us the, um, the, you know, about hard work and, and, uh, and making sure that you do the best you can. So that's, right. all, they, that's all you can ask. 
Exactly, that's wonderful. I'm so sorry to hear about your brother. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, when we were on that um, 1995 World Cup, I actually one time I begged um, Bob Dwyer, instead of going with the team on the plane, could I go down the Great Ocean Road? And I caught up with Nick Far Jones and Simon Poydeburn, who were clients of mine for Sports Massage. And we watched in an empty stadium, pretending to watch Wales play Japan. And they told me, shh, don't scream and whatever. But when I was on the tour, I got told, you just tell people you're Australian and not to cheer for Wales at all. So did you get any ribbon off the guys because you've got English um, background? No, no, look, well, firstly, I didn't really tell too many people as least as many, at least as many as possible. And, uh, and you know, England is, is one of the, the great you know, historic phase of the, of the Aussies. So I've always yeah. been a uh, staunch, staunch one to, to, uh, to, to be against the English and very fortunately played in a, uh, you know, a, a number of teams that, that uh, we ended on the right side of the ledger in those games, except obviously in 95 in that World Cup, which, yeah. uh, which we, never, we never get told to forget. Exactly. But how did your rugby career start? Because I believe you were just a young kid when you started out. Yeah, so I was at, at the, as I said, I was at the convent for, th for three years under the nuns. Very tough <laughs> ladies, those were. And, uh, and, and so the, a couple of the three mates of mine um, who were still mates of mine today in uh, all the uh, ripe old age of grade two, you know, suggested I come there because obviously dad, being from England, had a soccer background. He didn't have a, a rugby background. And, uh, and so they just dragged me down, the, down to the local park to, to have, a game of, have a game of rugby and, and learn what it was. And I went down there and basically the, the coach down there said, you know, you're short. You're fat, you're slow, you've got no skills, you're a perfect prop, get in there. And so <laughs> that's where I started and that's where I finished. <laughs> that's hysterical. And um, I know you're one of um, the only 20 players who've actually won multiple World Cups. How does that feel like? Oh, well, very honoured, I, I should say. And there's, uh, so there's five Aussies, there's five of us. And, and, uh, but I must admit, you know, from my point of view, I, I played a cameo. I, I was holding on to the back of the shirt tails of some great players, you know, in those, both the 90 and, and uh, 99 World Cups. They had, uh, we had some exceptional guys in, in that team. And the coach you mentioned before, Bob DeWire, who was a coach in 91 and 95, you know, and as, as he said, you know, for a, for a team to win a World Cup, You've got to have at least five or six uh, world, you know, world-class players, and we were very fortunate uh, in both of those teams that we had, you know, a half a dozen, if not more, world-class players, the number one people in their spots, um, to be able to, to win those. So they're they're very difficult, and we had a good a good squad of guys, um, very close, and, and worked really hard together on and off the field um, to make sure that they we we did the best we possibly could. So. I'm, I'm proud from the collectively, you know, that the group of us in both squads, um, you know, really, really put in. A lot of people don't see how much work the guys put in for, you know, for, for years, but, you know, down to that last six months of how hard it, it is. And, and there is a lot of luck that goes with that with regards to that. But as they say, you make your own luck um, with, mm. with the hard preparation that they do. Oh, and in 95, it, unfortunately, you know, which... Which no disrespect to, to the, the playing group, we we didn't have that half a dozen world class players, mm. and uh, and so we unfortunately we got knocked out early against the, the English um, in the quarter. But I think yeah. that you know we would have run up against the Kiwis in the semi, and we 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 wouldn't have deserved to win that game because we we just weren't playing to the standard that they, that the rest of the comp were playing at. Right. I know you're very humble and in my eyes, you were all absolutely amazing and having gone to so many training sessions, you know, I realize how much work goes in and then you're doing, you know, watching videos and you have your psychology talks and nutrition talks, et cetera, et cetera. When you started, you had to work as well. Obviously, what was it? Was it easy to make that transition? Because you went from being 
working full time, playing rugby full time, and God knows what else as well, and then going into just professional full time. Was that easy to do? Um, look, it's been a, it was a transitional phase, and it was in, it, it was uh, an interesting time uh, from that '96 period to, to when I finished in 2000. In, in the fact that rugby and, and everybody within rugby were still struggling to understand what what full time professionalism meant. So, from my perspective, I was fortunate enough that, that um, I actually by the, left the police in '95, and and then. 96 had just happened to go professional, but I'd already started my business. And right. I was, we were at that stage because it was the great unknown, you didn't know what this professionalism was all about. Yeah. I, I uh, made sure I kept kept working at the same time because, you know, I try and, as I keep saying, the, the young guys now, you know, you might be focused and want to be a professional uh, sports person in whatever sport it is, but you've got to have a plan B, you know, and uh, because unfortunately getting to the top of the mountain is a very pointy top um, mm -hmm. and only a limited amount of people make it even a small amount of people stay in it for a longer bit long period of time to make it you know enough to set them up for life and as we said before good luck is one thing and and luck as in from being picked you know and and uh, and being the right place at the right time to the person who having a, an injury that puts you out and mm -hmm. and you don't know, play again so I'm a person that you want to have a plan B, you know. So I kept I kept actually working throughout that period of time. So we even to the extent whereby when we get the training, we were at the start we were just training like we used to train in the afternoon. So you're able to get through work, and then we started doing training where you do morning sessions and you do an afternoon session. So I'd actually go into work at five in the morning, uh, work through till eight, leave, go and do training in the morning, go back to work through the middle of the day then do, we do our afternoon session of four to six. And then if I had to either go home or go back and, and finish off doing work. So trying to balance off in between times. So, and again, I, 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 I don't think that was for me personally, was that much of a bad thing. It's um, because the last thing that I think that's one of the, the areas where uh, people struggle today is that they make uh, their professional all, all in, you know, all consuming. And as a result, especially when things aren't clicking and gelling perfectly, then they have no other no other avenue of release mentally to be able to focus on some other stuff. So it, it, it is a balance. And as I was, I was um, as I said, talking to someone the other day, and, and he's a young fellow just picked up his first uh, part-time professional contract. And uh, and I asked him what else do you want to do, and he he he, he actually has got a job and he's enjoying it at the moment. But he said I don't know if if I want to continue doing that. And I said, well, you know, what I, if I can only suggest is that even if you go and offer your your services to your different employers for free, and do it yeah. and just get a feel of what it's like, and 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 you do that a dozen times. Because the last thing you want to do, which happens to a lot of the guys, they, they jump out at that 30, 35 year old mark um, where they've, you know, whether they've been at the top of the game or, you know, across the middle of the pack throughout that period of time. But then they sit out there at 30, 35 years old, they're where everybody else was at 18. So they're, they're, they're going from job to job trying to work out what they're passionate about. And that's something that, that I believe that, that, sporting and some do it really well others not so um should be assisting uh, these guys just to go and get their toe in the water it's it is it's harder said than done because a lot of guys you know at that age think they're bulletproof and, and nothing's going to happen and they're going to be the best in the world for that period of time and stuff and and work and we can work that out later if i'm making enough money but to be able to work out what they're passionate about and it doesn't matter what it is is really important for them going for them going forward. That, that's actually a very good tip. And do you have kids that are thinking about being a professional sportsman? Oh, no, well, the, the biggest thing, um, never, I'm not saying don't give it the absolute 110% crack you can. And, yeah. you know, from that perspective, you know, you can't use an excuse by saying that, that only, only they know whether they've given it 110%. 
because yeah. someone can say, doing you know everything expected of them, but they know whether they've got some more gas in the tank. So they've got to give it a hundred, you know, that hundred percent, absolutely hundred percent crack, so they can hold their hand on their heart. If they don't make it, and yeah. go, there's nothing else I could have possibly done, and they've got no regrets, you know. And that's the same from a you know from a work perspective as well. That that yeah. once they get into that, give give whatever they're doing a hundred and ten percent, so that, that they know that they've left nothing behind. Great, that's great tips for both being um, a professional sportsman and a business person. And I actually interviewed um, Phil Johnson, a psychologist, when he was working for the ASM Monaco football team. And he says he feels that any team player, any team sports, are great business people. Because um, the, in your example, a rugby player, you know your position, you know your strengths and weaknesses, and you know the people around you. So you're always watching out for one another. And you can impart a lot of this strategy and the discipline and the focus into business life. How is it with your business? Like, I know you've grown now to over 900 staff. Do you want to tell us firstly, what is your business, what it's about, how you got into it and how you've grown so rapidly? Okay, so we, we, we're a services group, so we've got three different divisions in our business. One, which was the original one, which is our, um, our risk, what we call our risk mitigation business. So we do work for government, uh, large employers and insurance companies around anything from workers, workers' compensation claims through to uh, HR disputes um, and everything in between. To be able to, to so what we do is, is verify the facts for people and then provide them the information that they can then make a, uh, an informed decision on, on what it is. And that's whether or not to pay a person a claim um, through to, it is, is one, you know, one person's version of what occurred in, in, a, in a workplace incident the same as the other one. We do, mm. uh, and then that's from, uh, in one area, and then we do a lot of surveillance work, you know, the, the people that follow people around when they're not supposed to be doing the right thing. So we do a, <laughs> That again, just you know, and a lot of time it's confirming that what the people say is correct, and um, because there's a lot of obviously a lot of money that is in, involved with a lot of uh, claims and those sorts of things, and and then there's other areas from, from a government perspective where people are, are being fraudulent, so they want to find out that sort of stuff. So that's the, the risk mitigation business. We have another business, health business, which uh, which we class as our health safety response business. So again, we we work a, a, a range of areas from assisting claims management uh, with regards to their workers' comp uh, claims and injury management around that area there, through to we provide nurses, paramedics, and firefighters to the mines and oil and gas um, around Australia. All three are completely uh, <laughs> uh, different businesses. And lastly, we have a uh, traffic management business. So we have the stop go people on the side of the road. So again, it's still, all three of them are involving risk mitigation to one way, shape or form. You know, we, we look to keep the client and the public safe when they're out in the road, when, when, when road works are being done or whatever the case may be. So um, we have those, those three areas. It's wonderful that you've kept the theme of looking after the public and making sure everybody's healthy and safe and that people are doing and what advice um, would you give to young children just starting out well not children but young people or entrepreneurs because now with covid many jobs anymore and many people are looking um, to try a new avenue and you're obviously very successful uh, I, I think, as I mentioned before, I think the, the issue is around just give everything percent crack and effort. Yeah. You know, it's very, and, and again, they're the only people that actually know if they give it 100% effort. Yeah. And you're not always going to succeed. And what you want to do is then ensure that what you're doing, you're, you're passionate about. And it doesn't mean that you, yeah. um, you, you have to be passionate about the actual um, business. From my perspective, it's about being passionate about making sure we're trying to be successful in, in the different areas that we work, and that everybody, is, is, you know, in the business is, is is rising up and trying to bring people from from where they start and grow them in the business as we grow the business. So 
I'm just I'm really passionate about you know being successful in what we're doing. Other people obviously will, will be different, um, different things uh, float their boat differently. But you know it doesn't matter if you love driving buses. Mm. You know at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it doesn't mean you can't own the bus company. You know yeah. and you know. Uh, so it, I think it's it, um, I might not have the right the right person, but I think it's Jack Nasser who started yeah. off on the shop floor and forward. You know, and and now he's the global boss. You know, so yeah. you know it just shows you what, what if you've got tenacity and you've got passion about what you're doing, then you know from from for us in Australia, you know especially, you know there is no impediment to succeeding. You know, we we live in a country where you've got so much opportunity to 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 be successful um, and without very many roadblocks at all. And and the beauty is that that which from a rugby perspective, I've, I've uh, been very, very fortunate in that everybody in the in a rugby community, the one thing I, I love about them, and it's very wide and vast, is that everybody's really keen to help you. They're, they're, they're passionate about helping you. But it's not because, you know, I've, I've been a representative player, but that's exactly the same if you go to, you know, to... Um, to the, the, the to Roma and the, and the and the Roma team and and the Toowoomba team and, and um, whoever it doesn't matter where they are they're all England and yeah. and they're very keen to give everybody a chance um, as long as you know you take that opportunity um, yeah. as I've said before the beauty about rugby is it'll give you the opportunity to get your foot in the door yeah. whether or not you keep that door open or not is about yeah. you and, and how good you, you're willing to work and how hard you're willing to work. But the, the, the opportunity is there. You haven't got the excuse. Yeah. I guess, you know, the last 20 years, young children have grown up, you know, with no hardship. And now having the coronavirus, it's like, oh, my God, you know, that's the the most important thing for them, that they can't go out and socialise and meet their friends and so forth. Um, so I guess like what you're saying is about determination and following it through and giving it 110% no matter what you do. I just want um, to know though, how did you actually get in the business and you keep saying we, and did you start with one avenue and then get another one and the third one? Yeah, so the, so the risk mitigation business was the start. So we had a couple of little bits and pieces in that. We had a small debt collection. I say we as in the business. Um, oh, okay. Because I was like, who was he with? And what yeah, was so, the idea that that sparked inside you to do this business? Uh, good question. I don't know. I think it was just staying something close to what I knew, you know, to start with. So yeah. we actually started with um, the, the business. Actually, I started with, and we talk about the rugby community, a, President of the Queensland Rugby Union at the time, Leo Williams, who, who passed away many years ago. Fantastic bloke, great shirt to, to, to Australian rugby. Um, and I'd said that I was leaving, and I, you know, it was actually whilst, sorry, before I left the police, I, it was because it was amateur, um, you weren't getting paid. I think you got a $30 a day allowance, I think, when you're on tour. And and so I, I actually started. The, the, the start of this business when I was in the in the place where allowed you were allowed to have a second job back then. And um, and so uh, I because you go on tour and stuff, you'd be away, you know, three or four months of the year. Holidays. Um, so I had no so I'd have to take time off of their pay. The police would still let you go away, but that you wouldn't get paid. And yeah. so um, so I had no money. You know, I was married, first child on the way, thought we I've got to start and yeah. I'm going to have to actually finish, stop playing football. And so I had a talk to, to Leo and actually and he said, what about, what about process serving? Serving writs and summonses on people because he was connected with different law firms and different bits and pieces. And, and he said, I, we, I can help you with the law firms. We are able to start this. So on the side, uh, when I wasn't, when I wasn't uh, doing the uh, doing normal work or playing football, I was serving summonses. And then it got bigger and bigger. So I actually brought on a, 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 brought on a partner with me for a period of time and, and uh, cause he ran it while I was away. And then uh, that got bigger and we sold that off. Then I uh, got into debt collection cause we were working with the same people and, and then sold that, sold that uh, small business off. And then stayed with the risk mitigation business as it grew. I, um, 
to grow up around Australia, I, uh, I hooked up with a, um, uh, an ex, uh, friend in New South Wales, ex New South Wales copper. So, uh, and he's been in it um, since, since that time and, and is a part owner of the business and, so, and helped grow up throughout Australia. Fantastic. That's incredible. And it's good that, you know, you kept with what you know, because I often say to people, whatever you're passionate about, just make it a business. And I've been hearing so many success stories lately with people who have lost their business and they've turned their hobby, if you like, into a passion. And now for you, have you been a passionate writer? Because how did you get into writing your book? Well, so a, a, gen a gentleman by the name of John Fallon, John passed, passed away earlier this year, and he was actually uh, doing management work for me, my manager at, that, at the time, and um, I just finished, you know, I finished playing, playing rugby and doing some bits and pieces, and John had been at me all the time about saying, you should put this into a book, you should write it, and, uh, and so on. I said, oh, look, you know, no, I don't think so. And, and he, he, he then said to me, look, if I get a publisher for you, will you, will you write it? I said, oh, you won't get anybody to, to get that. And he said, I'll make a deal. If I get one, will you write it? And I said, okay, no worries. So he came back 48 hours later and said, I've got it signed up. You're ready to go. So uh, I, I was too smart for my own good, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, and, and on, I should have known better. But, so it was a gentleman by the name of actually Larry Ryder. Um, he, who is a, a, a writer? So he actually helped me um, to to uh, to write everything down. I was interestingly enough, I knew, I, I recalled, and my, my memory is not the greatest at the best of times, but I, I recalled more about the the policing days than I did around the rugby days. And uh, and so I said to Larry, you concentrate on the on writing the, the stuff around the footy and then getting all that up, and then I'll start, you know putting down some bits and pieces around around the policing days. And there, there it happened. Oh, fantastic. And, you, and, and then you find it in the $2 bill at the airport. Yes. <laughs> and I believe you're writing another book. What Are you allowed to say what that's about? Oh, no, 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 I'm not writing. No, I'm definitely not writing another one. My um, my, my wife was... was uh, a little bit antsy. I did the first one, so uh, so right. you might to let uh, all things lie. Yeah, I was going to say, how do you manage to juggle everything? Because all the time you were playing rugby and a, a policeman, and you know, travelling and this and that and the other. And you mentioned in the beginning how tough it was without money with your wife and the first one on the way. But you've actually got four children, so that must have been a bit yeah. of a juggle. Oh, I'm very much a juggle for her. I, I must, yeah. you know, like she, she uh, definitely pulled, pulled more weight than I did when it came to, to doing all the work around the family and stuff like that. And I think we were very fortunate around, you know, um, around both of our family support network around us were very strong and, uh, and always there to, to, to help. So that makes a massive difference. We're very fortunate from that perspective. And for, for my, my, my thing is that, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly good at being able to compartmentalise things. And so it's just put, have, have a certain period of time, do whatever you've got to do and then move on. And I think that from a work perspective and a health perspective, with regards to, to uh, even now as you get older, you know, being able to compartmentalise things and say, okay, I've got to have this time to do this, I've got to have this time to do that. You know, without, without that sort of organisation, it gets a bit chaotic. Yeah, you need the me time. And do you still work out or do you follow a healthy diet? And what do you do to downtime relax? Do you meditate, for example? <laughs> well, actually, well, I suppose it's, it's, uh, I've always tried to keep doing uh, training and stuff over the last uh, few years. Because uh, one of my problems when I was playing was I wasn't looking one of the biggest players, so I used to always have trouble keeping weight on, and uh, and whereas other guys have trouble taking weight off, and 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 so, but so I'd always, you know, continually tried to keep um, more weight on than I really needed. But now, now as you get older, you know, it's about taking the weight off because you don't you don't need to keep it. Yeah. You know, and so obviously harder as you get older to to do that. But 
So I, I usually train, you know, at least five to six days a week. Um, I'll find time in the morning. I get up early and and, uh, and smash it out uh, before before work because I know if I get it done yeah. later, and leave it in the afternoon is always an excuse or a reason a reason for doing that. One of the things, um, I'm not sure if you know that. What is it now? 2000. So end of 2012, 2013. I actually uh, uh, ended up in the hospital and rehab for for uh, six months with regards to um, I had a stroke. So I, oh um, my god! The, doc the doctors still don't know what, what actually occurred. But I uh, split an artery, in the vertebral artery, in the back of my neck. Um, how it happened, the doctors don't know. It just happened, and I threw a blood clot, and then. Um, all held by close. So I uh, spent uh, a significant time by sitting in the hospital. I couldn't because uh, it knocked out the hole by that side of my body. So I couldn't I couldn't walk, couldn't use my left and my left hand. Um, unfortunately to my uh, to my wife's disgust it actually knocked my voice box out. I couldn't talk and, and I had to learn how to do that but she says I've regained that pretty well. So but I was, I was like obviously very fortunate compared to other people with regards to being able to regain all my bits and pieces. But I think one of the things the reason why I say it, I think one of the things around it was that I was very fortunate and that and the physios and, and that said that I was very fortunate and was able to regain a tremendous amount of my uh, motor skills back was because I had a level of fitness. Um, if I didn't have that, then, then it would, I would have struggled to be able to do um, what they were putting me through to, to regain that sort of stuff. So it's super important for everybody to make sure they keep themselves as, I know it's easier said than done, but yeah. to try and keep yourself, you know, fairly fit now. Oh my God, just hearing your story, that's incredible. And if people don't get slapped in the face and a big wake up to look after themselves, there's something wrong with them. So thank you for sharing that. I didn't know. Oh my God, you are absolutely incredible. You're amazing. You've self-healed and brought yourself back into complete alignment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how old are your children now? And are any of them sporty? Uh, I've got a young fellow, young fellow uh, 19, and so he plays a bit of rugby. He's a, he's a halfback, so... So I say he's got the build of his mother, the skills of his father. And he's, he's a typical halfback too. He's a little smarty. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, then I've got uh, three girls, 21 to 29. Oh, fabulous, fabulous. And um, if you had known something today would there, that could have helped you along your pathway, what would that have been? That's a would really interesting question. Oh, no, I, you know, I don't think there's one particular thing. And I think the, the biggest thing is that, that look, you know, if I look at from a business perspective and I look at uh, things that I did six or seven years ago um, that I, I think, geez, I wish I didn't do that. You know, there's things in, in sport that, you know, that we talk about. And I, I was, I was, I talk about, you know, giving 110%, but there was time, periods of time through that period of time that I didn't give 110 percent you know so I think that you know over it there isn't one particular thing the only thing I can you know say is across the board is that you know uh, you, you, yes everybody's going to make mistakes or can do things differently but the big thing is is learn from them and don't do them twice you know that's that's the big thing and that's what continually will make you better and it doesn't matter whether you're 15, 25 or 55 or 75, I would imagine, um, is that you should never stop learning from, from different bits and pieces. And, and look from a learning perspective, whether or not it's, we talked about health, whether or not it's about business, whether or not it's about anything, um, and you know, about your, you know, your, your relationship with your family, all that sort of, you've got to continually to, to work on it and build it or it, or it stagnates and fades. That's really good advice. I was going to ask you if there was one thing you could do to change the world, and I'm sure you just covered it, unless you have something else that you would like to do to change the world. I just, uh, yeah, that thing, just purely that, I mentioned before about how people aren't, you know, to police, they aren't, they're mm. very disrespectful. 
all that sort of stuff. But it's not to any religious response. It's not just that, you know. I think that, unfortunately, to a certain extent, and not everybody, of course, because there's some magnificent people out there, but if, if everybody could just change their tune a little bit to have a look at what they can do for other people, just to some way, shape or form, yeah. But we seem to be very, very much, it's all about me and it's all about what, what's in it for me and what can I do and why should I do anything for anybody if it's not for me? And yeah. I don't, it doesn't mean you have to turn your life around to be, you know, a crusader, a crusader. But if they could just change the dial by 10%, I think it'll make a massive difference in the world. Oh, that's wonderful. I totally agree with you as well. And how do people contact you? How can they get hold of you? About what? <laughs> what <would you laughs> mean, you know? Well, you know, to learn more about um, your business, I'm sure there's many listeners thinking, oh, maybe my company needs his services for um, being a private investigator, etc., etc. Or oh, just no, no problems. Sorry, but, but uh, no, um, sorry, no, my company is Verifact, V E R I F A C T. So it actually started as it was from the first business which is yep. a combination of verified effects. So that's how the, the business came around, Verifact. So just verifact.com.au, just go to the website and I'll be able to hook up with us that way easy. Oh, wonderful. I'll add it on the written blurb as well. And no um, one more thing um, for the listeners, um, is there a piece of tips during the COVID that you'd like to share with them? We're blessed. Um, at the moment in Australia, like my husband and I, when you talked about not wanting to go to England, it took me about five years to get him to go to Wales. And there's no way he'd ever live there. And um, as you know, I Brisbane. And is I think we're in the best country in the world at the moment to live freely. So what are your tips? Because Australia's obviously done very well in containing the COVID. Oh, you're very right. Not uh, we're the best country in the world ever, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, we're very we're very fortunate. You know, we're very blessed this country. If I was the prime minister, if I had a golden wand and I was the prime minister, I'd get, give everybody a ticket overseas so then they understand how good they've got it back here. Um, some people don't realise what they've got because that's that's all they've known. But I think just purely from the point of view of that, yes, it is. It is. Uh, a disruption to your life sometimes you know the things that we get asked to do um mm. whilst this is going on and it is it, it is a bit uncomfortable but it, when we say uncomfortable it's only a little bit not compared to that so many people around the world and if we don't do it then there's going to be a lot of people who get very sick and will die you know and so yeah. we only again we only have to change the dial by 10 percent and everybody just do their little bit and then we'll be able to get through this until I'm hoping that everybody, uh, you know, joins uh, joins joins together and, and gets vaccinated, so we have that herd immunity, and that around the world that they can get it, you know, especially to, you know, I, I know Australia at the moment, everybody wants to get the vaccine here, and again, it's all about us, but there are millions, if not billions, of people who are far less than. Uh, fortunate than us in a very bad way around the world mm. you know I'd like to see you know hopefully I'd, I'd rather see, see us only the, uh, the old and the vulnerable here get, get it and give the rest overseas until until um, until we can we can stop people from dying around the place so we're, we're in a very fortunate position um, at the moment compared to others. Yeah thank you very much and thank you very much for giving up your precious time it's been a great honor and pleasure to interview you so thank you no it's been a, my pleasure as well like i said it's been a very long time we brought back some fantastic memories thank you <laughs>